We'll come back to you. John Olivares is a uh, poet that moved to San Antonio for the Maconda workshop, and he fell in love. Yes, you can be in a workshop and fall yes, in love. And unfortunately, he fell in love with a non-writer, so one person could get a job. <laughs> I was going to say non-writer. He, he lives here now. <laughs> He's a house husband, but más que nada, he writes beautiful pieces of, of writing. And I have to, full disclosure, he's my personal poetry editor. You know how you go to the gym and you say, eh, just be here for 10 minutes. And the, the coach says, no, 30 more minutes, 30 more laps. He does that to me. And he's a great editor. He's been my editor for over 10 years. He's also uh, affordable and for hire. So if anybody wants to reach him, they can reach him uh, out at his Twitter at John Espinosa. And, you know, John, you have writing that, uh, you know, I don't know what it is to be a boy in this lifetime. And you have things where you write, um, and next semester will come with David Martinez pounding Terrence Crawford because his face is black. Six gangsters from Penn West kicking Jose Chevara in the ribs because he is from the north side, all before completing my freshman year. That's the kind of writing that, you know, me da un poquito de, de susto, because I didn't have to live with those fears of getting beat up. I'm going to let you read, though, because we're going to run out of time before you know it. Read. John? Okay. Uh, um, the audio is lit off. Which Do I read a poem or that particular poem? Or? No, you do what you like. Como se, I think what, read okay. what you read. I just want to give people okay. a little... Okay, I hope my... Yeah. So let me read this poem. The audio is a little off, so I'm just going to jump right in. I don't. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to read this poem called Spanglish as Experienced by a Native Speaker. And it's a poem that I wrote in response to the release of the of the Adam Sandler vehicle uh, Spanglish, where I thought that's not Spanglish. You know, I, I, I uh, wanted to do justice to what Spanglish is. Spanglish as Experienced by a Native Speaker. A George Washington quarter was a quota. Two quotas bought us una soda from a vending machine. We asked Abuelito for a quota to play the video game console. No, he said, una peseta, no una quota. Una peseta para la máquina. He called the console a machine, like the machine máquina that dropped a quota for every six cans mother put in. La máquina is what father had us puchar across yardas on the weekends. At work, we ate lonche. At school, we ate lunch. At home, we ate both. Keiki was served on birthdays. It was bien gacho to have your birthday skipped again. Skipiar was done to the unsolvable math problem, which was never attempted again. Half our time was spent on homework. The other half was spent watchando TV. <laughs> Watcha signaled you were about to do something impressive, but foolish like a bike stunt. Watchale is what your friends tell you when you nearly plow into them with your bike. A bike is a bica. Uncle Jesse peddled a bica to the grocery store to buy leche y cornflakes. Leche. Not tortillas were heated in the microwave. Un way is a dude. Uncle Beto called more than two people una bola de weyes. I secretly listened to the Beastie Boys in Uncle Beto's troca because I could turn it up full blast. Uncle Jesse pedals back from Gaymar with two new plaid shirts. Dad's returning from his trip to the Dompe where he left last week's garbage. Mother's fixing spam sandwiches. Abuelito pulls from his pocket a peseta, but hands me a quota. Bravo, such a great poem for uh, San Antonio, where I learned how to speak Spanglish. You know, I didn't speak it that much. I wasn't that fluent <laughs> until I moved here. And then everything, it, this is such a brilliant place for uh, language and for poets, don't you think, John? Oh, yeah, uh, definitely. How's it different uh, from California? Different about, well, you know, the, um, the, the culture is very, very Mexicano. It's very 
um, uh, what do you call it, very um, connected to Mexico because it's relatively so so close. And I know California is, but in the parts that I grew up in California, it became very um, uh, so, sort of a, a pocho in, in a way. But um, I mean, not necessarily, but uh, um, we don't feel the border uh, as much. I mean, I'm sure some would argue argue so. But, uh, you know, San Antonio just has this, I guess, uh, sort of a Spanish architecture and landscapes with, you know, so many nopales. You know, I grew up with nopales, but, you know, I had never seen so many out in the wild like that. And it just kind of, uh, uh, to me, it's very inspiring because it, it is, you know, my my Chicanismo uh, and, and the Mexican culture that inspires my, my, my poetry. So in that way, it also, you know, uh, it, it's... It's it's a lot of nourishment for my for my poetry. Well, you know, you came from a house where you had a job from, since you were a little kid. You do a lot of gardening, helping the yeah. dad. A lot of your poems are about that thirst that the the poet has for getting out of there yeah. and the work you had to do to yeah. eat. You know, and I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit. How does one come from being a laborer, which you were as a child laborer, and how do you become a, a writer? Yeah. You know, I know there are a lot of people listening. They don't have a clue. Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess there's no one easy answer for that. But uh, being sort of my origins is that I think I've always um, been more in touch with my creative side. And uh, my mother uh, was very creative. You know, she liked to paint when she was younger. So I think I always had that kind of attachment to to the arts. Uh, and then, um, I mean, how I came to – well, I guess I always liked reading. My my mother read to me when we were very little, and she always supported my my book buying. You know, I remember uh, going to the book fairs in Mecca, California, a very small school. You know, we, but, you know, growing up in the '80s, there was no there were no bookstores. I didn't go to an actual bookstore until I was late in high school, and the only way we could get books is through the library or through the book fair. And you know, my my mom always gave me an allowance for the book fair. You know, she never told me no uh, with books, and she never threw them away. I have um, a few of my childhood books uh, still still left. So I think I've always kind of been in in you know, I've, I've been a voracious reader, and I've been in tune with I guess kind of um I I guess I've been introspective and and you know trying to figure out what life is, uh and and what what is the meaning of 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 all this. And I think poetry, uh, when I was introduced to, you know, uh, um, literary poetry, you know, serious poetry writing workshop, you know, and, and reading poems by, you know, Gary Soto, who was a laborer himself. I mean, he was a field worker, migrant worker. He uh, and uh, he, he's, you know, turned out to be a very talented poet uh, in which he would write these beautiful images and have these beautiful epiphanies all while you know working in the field and to me that just kind of really connected with me like oh my god like this i can do this i want to do this you know i love doing this and and other influences were philip levine who was you know also um, working class about labor and so you know it took a, a poetry workshop and and uh and some encouragement from from my professor uh back then christopher buckley to you know continue writing and and uh, being a, a poet, and uh, some of the, these poems in um, uh, this book, uh, Date, Fruit, Date Fruit Elegies, were were written in, in an undergraduate workshop. And uh, one poem in particular, Akinisa Palm Springs, um, I I wrote that after I wrote that for a workshop after I spent winter break working with my dad. Very kind of a uh, fresh. In that but didn't your poem. didn't your father say, "Mijo, don't write poems. You'll never make money. No lawns." <laughs> You know, you, you, how, actually, how do you get from from work mowing lawns and cutting yerbas, and then how did how did you even know? How did you know how to get to the you university? Know, you know, it, um, well, that's a really good question. Again, I think uh, you know, I, I went to Indio High School, and and uh, they were Indio High School was very much willing to help you get into college, and and they also had like partnerships with UC Riverside where I went. Uh, you know, I did programs like, um, oh gosh, you know, I, I, I forget the name, but those, those, um, kind of those programs that funnel, you know, um, the, in high school to, to college and those programs are, are what helped me. And my, my dad, of course, you know, he didn't want us to be laborers. You know, he wanted us to, to have an easier life. So he always pushed schooling. 
So even though we went to work with him, I mean, because he wanted us to learn the, you know, uh, the, the work ethic, uh, you know, school was very important to him, you know, that we finish school, we go to school, we go to college and get a, a better, a better life. Um, but at lot I decided I wanted to pursue my MFA program, my MFA in, in poetry. And, and I, you know, pitched to my dad. I had 100 and my mom 100% support. From my mom and my dad. That's what I yeah, wanted to I do. Think, That's. I think we need to thank, different. and we do. If you look at the acknowledgments of working class writers, it's always like four pages, three pages. You know, a yeah. lot of people yes. shoulders that we're standing on. I, I know we're going to, you know, run out of time. So I want hold, John. You're doing a lot of things, even though you're uh, a house husband and being a caretaker, your primary caretaker for two small children during the pandemic. Oh, my God. And you're a writer. So can you tell us, like, some of the projects you're working on? Uh, like you have yeah. so many so, long uh, lists of like, upcoming stuff. Yeah. Uh, if anyone is interested in reading any of new work, I, I have a new poem published in this lovely magazine called Alta, which comes out of uh, uh, San Francisco. It's a... Um, it's a magazine about California and the West. It's uh, I have a poem called uh, "Portrait of a Bracero" as Jose Olivares, which is about my uh, my grandfather working as a bracero. I have another poem coming out in um, Airlight, which is coming out of USC. Uh, that's forthcoming. Um, I'm I finally having um, uh, three poems published in an anthology, but those poems have been translated in Spanish, and it's, they've been translated by Liliana Valenzuela, who I'm. Um, <laughs> Obviously, you know who that that is. So um, I'm very excited to finally have poems translated in Spanish that I can share to my Spanish-speaking um, uh, uh, family. And, uh, and and lastly, I'm doing a uh, curated conversations with Liliana Valenzuela on on her own uh, book, Codex of Love. And where can people find you? Uh, they can find me on on Twitter. Uh, that my handle is at John Espinosa for anyone who's uh, interested in, in my goings ons or, or wants to contact me. And, you know, I, he, he has little stories in here called 25 cent stories. So he's a master storyteller, too. There's some really good ones that I wish we could share today, but we are running out of time. And as I said, John Espino, Olivares Espinosa, a, a wonderful poet. I wish I could write poems like this, although he's oh, my trainer you. and I can't write his poems. Thank you, John. Thank you. And to hang on, because we'll have thank time you. for questions at the end. I want to go back to uh, Diana uh, Marie Delgado. Did we resolve our tech issues? I, I don't know. Can you all hear me now? Is this better? Can yeah, if you speak up real loud, I think we can maybe deal with it. You know, okay. um, Diana, uh, you come from a home also where it looks like there were no books, and if there were books, they were throwing them at you. So how did you become a writer? Um, I, I first became a writer as a reader. That was how I became a writer, was that I just wanted to read all of the time. Um, and I also spent a lot of time at the La Puente Library, um, which is in downtown La Puente. And I just was always a reader. Um, and then it kind of changed when I went to community college. Um, and I took a literature of the Mexican-American class with a teacher by the name of Margie Whalen. And I read poems, and I read Gary Soto, I read you, Sandra, I read Lorna D. Cervantes, Luis Rodriguez, and I, I saw myself for the first time. And I said, I don't know anything about this, I don't know how to do it, but I want to make other people feel the way that I felt when I was reading those poems. And yeah, but you went, you went from writing about a, a, a life where there's violence and, you know, uh, there's cruelty and you wound up, am I right? Did you get two MFAs? No, I think it's just my bad comma use, but I only have one F MFA, oh. uh, but they're both, in, they're both, um, sorry, I have a bachelor's in creative writing from UC Riverside. And okay. Then I, and then I got my MFA at Columbia University in New York. Can you explain for people out there who want to be you? Uh, can I give some advice? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. How do they become a poet, a published poet? People want to know. I think that one of the things is just to read. Read things that really inspire you to keep you going because it's a tricky, difficult thing. So it's just to poet. I would say 
way for somebody who's interested in doing that to succeed in what you can find Excuse me, can other people mute themselves on the panel so we can hear Deanna? You can mute yourself, the other panelists. There's some interference coming out. So if you can mute yourselves and just let Diana speak, that might have the, help the sound quality for us. And if people in the audience who have questions, on the upper right-hand corner in the chat room, you can ask questions, which we'll get to at the end. So excuse me, Diana, go on. You were saying how you know to read and go to the library, you can know. So I just, I was a nerd. All I cared about was books, magazines, sitting in the library, reading things, uh, reading dirty novels, funny novels, scary novels. I mean, everything, right? Uh, but I remember reading Helter Skelter when I was like 10 years old. I just didn't understand. All I, I just saw, saw it all as sort of like these, these worlds that I wanted to learn about. And I didn't differentiate between you know, like now as a writer or a, a serious writer, you're like, oh, there's all these categories. But as a reader, I just wanted to read. Um, and that's how I kind of fell into it. Um, and, and I still read a, a lot all of the time. Of and the what time. advice would you have for some young girl that's listening, that living that life in a house with a lot of violence around her and a lot of cruelty? You know, how do you walk that path and become you? I think, what advice would you give to them? I think for, for them to keep a diary, to keep a, keep a diary and what a diary, by, by recommending that somebody keep a diary, it means honoring your feelings. It means having a safe, creating a safe space for yourself to reflect on what's going on. There's no judgment. It's just you being yourself. Um, and honoring yourself. And I think but what if you don't have any privacy and you sleep on the couch and you don't even have a room with the door? <laughs> That's a good question. I think it's still important to separate like what you're experiencing from what's going on around you. And I think that's something that I just had a really, I just was able to do that to say, this is my, what I'm feeling. People are telling me it's fine, you know, um, but, but I, I just knew, and I think that those were the things that I shared with myself in like my writing. Um, and that's kind of what my book is, Tracing the Horse, is like me having an intimate conversation of all the secrets that my family was like, don't talk about this. And um, it created it created another world for me where I get to talk about it. Mm. Now I'm running out of time here, but I want you to tell me quickly, What's coming up for you? What are you working on so that people will know to look for? So I'm going, I'm currently working on a new project um, and I just received funding from the Arizona Commission of the Arts to develop a poetry manuscript that is uh, a re retelling or a recasting of the, this, uh, the Spanish conquest of the Aztec empire. So I'm working on that. Um, and I'll also be part of a virtual panel at uh, the Nepantla Familias Anthology at Book People in Austin on April 22nd at 6 p.m. Central. So I'll be on a panel uh, to promote that anthology. Okay. Are we out of time? Okay, we'll come back for the questions. I'm sure people have questions. And don't forget, you can always uh, support these writers by buying their books. And if you hang on to these books and get them signed, like in a couple of years, you might be able to fix your roof if you sell them on eBay when they're signed. So just tip there. Okay, All right, our next guest is uh, another uh, Texan writer. Uh, you know, I, I realize not everybody here are Texan writers, except for the next two are native Texans. And, you know, if you saw her in the grocery store, you would just think she looks like a nice, nice lady. And no, when you read her stuff, you got to like duck for cover. And her, her latest book is Fight Like a Man. And, uh, you know, I have loved her work for so long. I laugh out loud. I can't read it in a public space because I laugh out loud like a loca. And uh, Christine, I want you to read a little bit excerpt, so I'm going to just take it away. Christine Granados. Okay, thanks. I, rather than read an excerpt, because it is kind of bracy material, I'm going to read something from my podcast, and I just want to warn everybody that the following content contains strong language related to the existence of Santa Claus and tooth fairies. 
and it's intended for audiences of 10 years and older. <laughs> Which is better, the American or the Mexican tooth fairy? At eight months pregnant in November, in the early 2000s, I made the mistake of explaining to my mother-in-law that the grandchild of hers that I was carrying was going to be raised, was not going to be raised on lies. And in my best Psychology 101 speak, I waxed on about how lying to my ch child about Santa Claus would undermine his trust in me and in all people, and that my child would grow up knowing there is no such thing as Santa Claus. And I did this surrounded by about 100 Santa Claus figurines in the middle of my mother-in-law's living room. This woman who raised four children to adulthood including my husband, let me know in no uncertain terms, a lot like a Southern Bell Mafia boss, that my ideas about Santa would not be tolerated. When she said, bless your heart, then she smiled wide, my grandchild will believe in Santa Claus as long as I'm his nano, and I will pray for you to change your mind. Those prayers worked because I abandoned my psychology class ideas a lot like I did the actual psychology class that I quoted her because I dropped it as an undergrad at UTEP. So as I raised my two children, I embraced all the American mythologies, including the tooth fairy. So when our youngest child started kindergarten, the drama of the event was punctuated by his losing his very first tooth, and we marked the occasion with plenty of escándalo and a room, you know, and a round of ice cream for everybody. And then when nighttime fell, we literally and figuredly forgot about his the tooth, and so did the tooth fairy. And I found this out at 5 a.m. when our last child woke me up in a panic and his voice was trembling, Mama, the tooth fairy didn't come. Groggy, something touched my eyeball and I blinked. And it was his evidence, the forgotten tooth. He was showing it to me. Fully awake, I began to panic when I realized we forgot the dog bill under his pillow. Then I was seized by guilt, remembering the conversation we had had with his brother several hours earlier. That's the end for now. Christine? Okay. With several hours earlier, sorry, his older brother reminded him that when he had lost his tooth in El Paso, he got a visit from the American and the Mexican tooth fairies, and he got a lot of money. The kid had the good luck of losing his tooth during our annual trip to my hometown of El Paso. So in addition to the tooth fairy, both my parents, my mother, and my brother slipped money under his pillow. So the oldest raked in five bucks on one tooth. He was thrilled but confused when he found the large sum next the next day. And then he wondered why when he was at home in Central Texas, he only got one dollar under his pillow. Despite being, being fully awake then, I was at a loss for words. And thankfully, his nana, my mother, who also raised four children to adulthood, was quick on her feet. And she said, because here in El Paso, mijo, we live so close to the border that the Mexican tooth fairy comes too. Although I was grateful to her, all I could think was great. Now I'm gonna to have to keep up with another lie. These grandmothers are gonna be the end of me. And I wished I hadn't dropped that psychology course in college. Maybe she didn't like my tooth, the youngest said. And then he snapped me back to the reality that I was at a loss for words. So without my mother or mother-in-law to rescue me, I mumbled, she doesn't forget. Go back to your room, lie down. I've got to go to the restroom. I'll be in in a minute. So I was stalling, which worked because an answer came to me. I jumped out of bed and I felt for the man of the house's wallet in the dark. Then it took a $5 bill and I was down the hall before I realized that it was a $5 bill and I had to go back to get a dollar. And then annoyed hiss from the bed said, what's wrong now? I said, we forgot the tooth fairy. He sighed, oh, my wallets, I got it. Go back to sleep is what I told him. When the dollar, with the dollar bill in my hand, I headed toward his room. 
which had the overhead light shining, his quilt and his pillow thrown on the floor, and a little boy scouring the bed for change. As he lifted his sheets, he said, I bet the Mexican tooth fairy wouldn't forget me. His comment stirred my patriotic pride, and I said, the American tooth fairy never forgets, then added, let me help you look. And as we looked on his bed, I dropped the dollar bill on the floor, and he found it. And I said, see, there it is. You probably just dropped it looking for it. And then he turned the bill over in his hands and squinted and said, why did she leave my tooth? In desperation, I said, because the tooth fairy always leaves the first tooth for parents to keep. I still have your brothers. This was all the reassurance he needed. And he walked over to his dresser where he picked up his backyard again's wallet and opened it. As he put the dollar in his wallet, he said, I wish we were in El Paso where the American and Mexican tooth fairy could visit. And I said, me too, me too. Okay. Yay, I'm so glad you gave me the whole piece and not an excerpt. Um, you know, I have a question. Christine, you know I've been your fan for a long time, and I've sent your books to my editor in New York. I buy your books in multiples and send them around. I even wrote a blurb for you on a pizza box one day. One day, yes. do you remember that? Yes, and, I do. Uh, you know, and, and you kept the pizza box. But yes. uh, the thing that I, I don't get, like when you look at your world, you're writing about the Southwest, it's so in, in, embedded in, in the frontera, and that's why I love it, the heat. The way you write about the heat is like no one else, and you write about El Paso, but your books were published, you know, in Arizona and New Mexico. What's going on? That's, yeah, that's, I'm wondering too. I can't find a Texas publisher, but I'm very happy with Arizona and New Mexico. And New Mexico, El Paso, to be perfectly honest, is so far west that it kind of, you know, we kind of are a part of New Mexico. And I'm sorry for saying that. <laughs> um, more maybe the publishers more. need to like get on the program. Although we do have the wonderful Cinco Puntos in El Paso doing a fabulous job of yes. doing yes. like the whole America. So they're doing cool work. But yes. I, I'm yes. always a little astonished at how behind the university presses, you know, not all of them, but you know, as far as a lot of us, have to get look scrounge around and get published you know we can talk about this forever like it's really hard for our writing to be taken seriously here and i know like diana for example she had to go to school in new york to make those connections a lot of times writers that go to school in the east coast make connections with prizes and uh mentors so i i'm, I'm thinking about that like, you know there's a little disconnect there west of the mississippi uh but one of the things i like about you is that you have a sense of humor like no other woman you write things like there's no way to look sexy carrying a 50 quart pot of tamales <laughs> when i read that so true and i thought maybe you know who are you you know you're like a descendant of, of um, denise chavez no, you like part of like, you know, the literary yeah. family that you and you write about things that me parten el corazón. I feel heartbroken when I read your stories about a girl who wants bookshelves and she has to fight with her mother to get bookshelves. Her mother doesn't wonders why doesn't she just get like beauty products or hot irons? Why does she want bookshelves or or people that like you know on the bridge. They they look like poor people in party clothes. You see that, you know, that people are wearing their best from Mexico and they look like poor people in party clothes. Those kinds of things only you see. So what do you see for yourself in the future? Uh, you're the most wonderful observer with humor and passion and compassion. What do you see yourself in the future doing? Oh, I would love to be writing scripts for for movies, for plays, for for anything right now i'm i'm writing uh sports for a newspaper so why I I, you're like so brilliant why well it's, it's a lot of fun and you, you can you can also observe you know and tell stories of of people that's what keeps me interested in journalism and okay, I think it is a training yeah. all right but you have a play you're working on will you uh, mention that please yes uh interview um it's a a play about a woman living in El Paso who's trying to grow up with her family that's all in her business and she's just trying to have an interview by herself but her family won't let her they're going with her and um it was staged at 
a reading with stage and stages in Houston from the Sing Muros Festival on the Sing Muros Festival play. And then I've got um, my, my podcasts, which is Tales from the Hood, Motherhood, that is. And um, I started that during COVID when I wasn't and working. How can people find you, Christine? How can people find you? Like if they will say, oh, uh, I want to get in touch with that funny lady. How do they do that? They can go to my website, ChristineGranados.com, and everything is there, and my podcast, as well as my books, and your books. You are amazing. Books. You're doing amazing uh, pioneer work. I love that you say things that we're ashamed to say out loud, and you make me burst out laughing, and you make me cry. So all my gratitude for the work that you're doing, which I think is really sacred work. And we'll come back because we'll have questions at the end. But I want to make sure that we leave enough time now for our last guest, which is uh, Joe Jimenez, uh, a local boy done good. And I met Joe at one of the Macondo open mics. And like when he got up and read, we all like looked at each other and said, who's he? Let's get him. He's so good. Like, you know, you just kind of like appeared on a half shell and out of nowhere reading really strong work when you were very young. So I'm going to let you read an excerpt and then we'll talk. Joe Jimenez, woohoo! Woo thank you, thank you. And I do apologize for my dog making noise earlier. I don't, I really feel bad about that. He's a good dog, though. What I'm going to read about is, or I'm going to read from, is I'm a manuscript that I'm working on revisions for. And it's called Hot Boy Summer. It's about um, young gay kids in high school. So this is the protagonist. His name is Mac. And he says, let me just say this. If I'm going to talk about loyalty and friendship and love, I got to start with how I think friendships are made, how they grow. For real. Okay. First of all, the thing about making new friends is that their friends usually become your friends. It's true. It's like a web, right? Girl, like as a result of meeting me, Florencio and Camilo, the former friend. Okay. Maybe that's not such a great example, but meeting Cami meant that Florencio and I would also meet Mikey who was already friends with Cammy, whom I had seen around and low-key thought was on the reels, super hot, but actually very silent. And so maybe he was conceited, like a lot of hot guys who know they're hot are, or maybe just over it all, since high school can do that to you. But I'd never find out for sure until I met Florencio, and all the dominoes would fall into place. And so meeting Mikey as a result meant we would eventually meet Beth, who was actually the very first person who introduced herself to Mikey when he moved here from L.A., Girl, they made a music production, which was the closest thing our school had to this mixing and sound class Mikey was taking and loved at his old school. And Mikey was so serious about the whole DJ thing. More than serious, actually. It's his passion. Even now, I'm not sure what my passion is. I don't even know if I've ever felt passionate about anything. Like, does your body begin to radiate light or make a humming noise? When you finally find your passion, is there a buzzard that goes off? an alarm, some siren that shoots out of your heart like a beacon of hot light telling the world, he's got it, look out. She's found her passion, like a moment of bliss and euphoria and a click of drag queen angels singing an Ariana Grande song or blowing trumpets in the way that only clicks of drag queen angels can blow trumpets. I wouldn't know since I haven't discovered that thing in my life I'm passionate about. Is that strange? Like, is there a certain age by when you're supposed to experience this one vital emotion that so much of life is supposed to be fueled by if you're living your best life, like they say? What if I've missed the bus? Oh, like, what if my time is up and passion passed me by? Do I run behind it, chasing and waving my arms and yelling, hey, passion bus, wait for me, I'm coming. Sorry, I'm late. But I had to clean up the cereal and the shattered bowl parts that my father threw on the floor this morning because he couldn't find his truck keys. Ever smelled old rotten milk that seeps into a house's floorboards? Okay then, you, to you totally understand. I hate being late, I hate spilled, make spilled milk, and I hate when my dad makes drama and I have to clean it up. Girl, for real. So I'll stop right there. It's a story about kids trying to find their way in the world and discovering that the things that they used to love maybe aren't the things that they still love anymore. The characters are obsessed with RuPaul's Drag Race. And uh, one of the things that inspired me to go this route with the novel is that I listened um, to advice that Sandra gave me about writing about 10 things. I think you call it the 10 by 10, writing about 10 things that you love and that really only you can write that story the way you can write the story. 
And so that's what I focus on, things that I loved and that um, maybe aren't so embraced by others, but to me, they're everything. Oh, Joe, thank you. I'm glad that uh, those uh, 10 times 10, which I always teach, help you because I realized when I wrote House that I found my voice when I asked myself, what can I write about that no one else can write about in this room? And what do I, can, what do I know that 10 things that no one in my family knows or no one in my race or class or sexuality, like that. There's 10 times 10 times 10 ad infinitum. So I'm really glad because, uh, you know, your first novel, which I loved, uh, Bloodline, uh, was so beautiful and so San Antonian, and, and I, I knew the house and the rooms with my eyes shut. And, but I said, oh, where's the gay sexuality? You know, why is he holding back? You know, is, is he afraid his grandma's going to read it? What's going on here? <laughs> So, like, I'm really glad that this new manuscript from Progress is coming out. But I am afraid of getting fired, and I'm a high school teacher, so that is definitely yeah, you something are. that's at the front but of the my mind. But the thing you don't write, you write about love with tenderness, you know, the tender man, you know, that comes out in, in your book. I said, I think I told you this. If I was a man, I'd marry you. I think I said that to you, you know. But this is just beautiful writing. And I want to know, what isn't in your bio? What isn't there? Because I always look at a bio and have so many questions. What it isn't in your bio that made you a writer? Um, I always thought, I guess I never looked at myself as being a writer. It's not something I aspired to. I just wanted to get married, have a truck, have a whole bunch of dogs, have a house, and get a really good job where I could like live comfortably. Um, and then I started reading, as I started discovering things like your writing or Luis Alfaro's writing, um, Rigoberto's writing, I thought to myself, well, I want to say something, too, that that I think is important. And so that's really what motivated me to write. It, when I really started to take writing seriously, it's just because I wanted to. Um, I thought there were people out there like me that wanted to read about ironing or wanted to read about drag queens or wanted to read about um, being a 44-year-old man obsessed with Ariana Grande, which are things that I absolutely find in my heart. And um, so, yeah, I think everybody has a, a place at the table, I would like to think. And I think there's lots of people out there who should be writing things and maybe are writing in secret. They just need an opportunity to um to get those stories and those poems out there because they think there's room at the table for everybody. But Joe, don't you think we all write in secret in the beginning? Oh, definitely. Even now, I think with budgeting time, it's like I feel guilty if I'm not working on lessons for school, especially with virtual stuff. Oh my God, this last year's been for me, I'm very hopeful trying to be positive, very hopeful for the new school year when kids come back in person, because then it's like stuff that I know how to do, be a, a human with other humans. But Joe, think about uh, the gay kids in a, a city with, you know, Latino uh, homophobic culture. Uh, what a model you are of a man who pays for his bills and provides for his family and has dogs that have their shots and are tied to a tree <laughs> outside all year round, you know, yeah. clean house. I've been in your house. And it's nice, and you're kind to your animals and to other human beings. I think this is like you're a real man, which Cesar Chavez said, a real man is a man who protects the weak, and you do that. So I think, you know, your books are always about searching. How do you become a man? That's what, you know, your books are about. And so fascinating for me. You make me want to write because you're an outlaw in Latino culture, and as a single woman, who didn't want children, who doesn't have children, who doesn't have a partner, and who lives alone. I'm an outlaw, too. So I I really mean that in the blurb that, I, you know, that when I read your work, I run to get a pen. When I, I, I like the term outlaw, one, because I think the criminality of it or the deviancy kind of is exciting to me. It creates friction. And I think for me, with poems and with stories or novels, once you find that place of tension or friction, for me, that's where I can get some traction and start moving in a direction that I want to take the take the truth or my truth. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Joe, your, your dog wanted to get on, in on the show porque son puro amor, the dogs. Yeah, we forgive them because they are so loving. And, you know, when I was going through a really difficult time, I, I had a therapist in San Antonio and I rescue dogs, too. Mm -hmm. And she said uh, when we rescue animals, we're actually rescuing ourselves. Would you agree? Oh, definitely. I think um, before I had these two, I had two shoulder squeakless, and I know you have shoulder squeakless. And I think there's something very special about rescue dogs, kind of like 
people who've gone through hard times or people who really, if you really know suffering or you really know struggle, and that's not to diminish anybody else's experience, but I think there are certain experiences that when you're able to really know despair, then you can appreciate hope in a way that maybe others who've never had to go without a meal won't appreciate having a very simple meal, but it's a meal and it's grand and it's marvelous to someone. Yesterday we had breakfast at the Mennonite Church here on South St. Mary's in Eagle Land and met uh, Pastor John and uh, they had a service dog because a lot of the people that are immigrant refugees that they help shelter have, you know, had traumas like losing their babies crossing the river or being a, a gun held to your head or being gang raped and they have a service dog there to help people to heal and people who don't have a connection with animals don't realize what extraordinary curanderos um, mm -hmm. dogs can be no i agree i think there's something about a kind soul that just wants to be loved and i think mm -hmm. that's what dogs oftentimes present to me Joe, let's pretend that uh, there's a young, a closeted a gay person out in San Antonio watching this. What advice would you like to give them? Oh, find your people. It'd be happy, be joyful, learn how to protect yourself, but don't, don't ever become small so that other people can feel large in the room, especially not at your expense. Mm, Mr. Guru, Mr. Guru. That's I'm just saying what a therapist told me one time. <laughs> it's not my <laughs> idea. And I think we need to know that, you know, if we can't heal ourselves, go get get thee to a therapist. And there are uh, sliding scales, affordable, and there's right. a lot of stigma and shame in our culture about therapists. Before we leave, Joe Jimenez, what's up on the horizon so that our uh, listeners and viewers can find you and find new work? How do they find you? How do they find your new projects? Um, the, for, the newest thing I have is an essay that I'm kind of proud of. I wrote it for the National Council of Teachers of English, which is the fancy high school teacher journal. I never thought I would put anything in that journal, but it's about um, being a teacher who cries in front of his class. And especially as a male teacher, like, what do you make of that when you have to become human in a way that um, is either disregarded, looked down upon, or maybe even considered dangerous, especially in like a public school space? Um, and I, I was really happy with, with writing that, especially during or during the last year when um just I don't know who hasn't felt emotional the past year. But the other thing I'm working on is really just trying to revise this novel. Um, I have a lot of hope in it. I think that it, once you, when you fall in love with a character or a group of characters, then um I want to treat them as kindly as, as as somebody would treat me if I was a character. I hope with also giving me the freedom to um not have to be perfect or not have to be a model character because I think that's a trap. Um, my website you. is joehimenez.net. Okay, you heard it here. And I'm gonna wrap up here my version of the Graham Norton Show so that we can have the last couple of minutes for questions from you all. And take it away, Lily. Where is she, our moderator? Lily, Lily, where are you? Okay, well, I don't know if she's gonna come back, but I know we have uh, five, minutes left for people from the audience and I hope she comes back because I don't know how to get the questions out and ask them. Um, Can someone see the questions? Maybe I'm not looking at the right place. All right, there she is. Hi, Lily. Hi. <laughs> I want to apologize to the audience for those earlier tech issues. That would never happen on the Graham Norton show. Um, but um, I'm back and, you know, please send us your questions. I wanted to kind of get started uh, just, you know, off of what Joe was saying there towards the end this past year. My God. So I wanted to give John and Diana and Christine a chance to maybe talk about how has your writing process changed during the past year? I feel like you know, um, artists have maybe been struggling or maybe you've turned to your art in order to cope with everything that the past year brought. So so let us know. Um, and Sandra, I'm sure there's going to be questions for you, too. And feel free to chime in. OK, well, I guess I'll start. Um, during, I don't know, a lot of people were part of the winter storm, Yuri. Um, and we were without electricity. We're trying to publish a newspaper. So all I've been doing is writing short features and I've done nothing creatively for the last year. <laughs> it feels like, 
I don't know about everybody else. <laughs> because of winter storm, COVID, everything else you can imagine. How about you all? Um, I just want to check, can you all hear me now better or is it still okay? Yeah, and, and I'm getting messages that people want you to read something to make up for the lost time. Um, perfect. Well, now that you all can hear me, this is my voice. This is how I talk. Um, thank you for, uh, for the notes about me reading. Really appreciate it. I was like so sad that I couldn't, you guys couldn't hear me. I'm going to read the first poem in the book, Tracing the Horse. Uh, the photo of the, the, the cover of the book is actually my parents. So the, the, those are characters or, you know, those are people that are in my book. Um, so I'm going to read the first poem. Wait a second. They didn't, they didn't sue you? They didn't know. Um, there was somebody just like this was taken in the uh, there's like a, uh, in downtown L.A. This is where I was being baptized. So I'm the I'm the person. in the, you know, sh is shrouded, you know, in the, the, the white uh, blanket. Little Swan. Most nights I'm face to face with the stars. No one is more afraid of this than me. So I find places to lie down and signify. I'm practicing a play where my brother's doing time in prison and I'm locked out of the house. Walking is like falling down or watching your uncle pull himself onto his wheelchair, the sun moving over his arms like a blessing. At least I had a mother who could sew her name into my hair. I want to lie in her stomach again and understand the drive to hurt something young, wild with sky. My father and brother enter and one of them says, you should start this story with the death of a child. Thank you everyone <laughs> for listening. Now, how has your writing anybody... process changed, Diana, during the, the past year? Um, how has what? My your writing, writing process? process? I think I've been um, reading a lot more and focusing less on sort of finishing anything and using it more as like an exploratory discovery time of what it means because we had this idea right writers have this idea like I need more time I need more time and now we had more time and then you realize like do I really want to be in front of my computer alone writing probably not I want to be outside so I think that's been an interesting thing for me to actually have time and decide to do things that were actually more fun and, and we're healing than, than to sit in front of my computer. John, we haven't heard from you. John's uh, frozen. John, yeah, he's, oh, he's back. John? At the beginning and it, with the, the lockdown when everything was being I think we're we're losing John. And but uh okay, I'll just I'll just talk make a quick answer. Uh, uh when there was when no one expected anything from you, you know, I I, I a lot. Um because there was I cannot hear you guys. Oh. Yeah, we're having a hard time hearing mm -hmm. you. I'll um, just uh, say I, I wrote a lot, and I've been uh, working on what what it was that I wrote. But uh, yeah. otherwise, I'll pass the torch to uh, Joe. He might have better audio. Oh, I echo what Diana and what Christine have shared. I just have to take a second. Okay. That line, Diana, the we'll go a mother who can Joe. sew a mother who can sew her name in your hair. Oh my gosh, oh my I will God. stick with me forever. I love that line. That's Thank you. yeah. Thank you. Hmm. Well, I love seeing you all support one another. And, you know, the spirit of this session is that Sandra is lending, you know, her fame, her um, her stage to to you all. So I'm wondering if, if there's somebody that you want, you know, the audience to have on their radar, if you want to kind of pass the torch similar to what Sandra is doing here. Christine, you want to start? Sure. Um, definitely read Cheryl Luna, one of the top Chicana poets in the United States, in my view. 
sherilluna.com. Um, and Pat Taylor. I love her prose. <laughs> who's, who's that? Pat Little Dog Taylor. Pat Little Dog. I, I'm in. Yeah, I was trying to get her to publish a new book of poetry, but her, her son just passed away, so she's in mourning. And uh, oh. she's one of the overlooked oh. Texas voices. I, I amen to that. Good. I'd like to give a shout out to, uh, you know, as we all know, uh, there's a lot of poets <laughs> and um, there's like four new books that came out and these are all uh, Latinx poets. Michael Torres, Felicia Zamora, Sheila Maldonado and Ricardo Maldonado. They all have amazing books. Check them out. Um, and and um, some of those are, are debut books, right? Of writers who've been working on things for a long time and you finally get to see their work. So that's Michael Torres, Felicia Zamora, Sheila Maldonado, and Ricardo Maldonado. Yeah, uh, for me, one one person I believe is doing the festival is uh, Benjamin Garcia. I uh, really like his, his book. And then uh, I just read uh, Jacqueline Valderrama's book, uh, Now in Color, uh, who's also a UC Riverside graduate like Diana and I. So I'd like to uh, give shout outs to them. Oh, and Joe stepped away for a second. <laughs> What's that? That's what you get. It's Sheila Maldonado. That's what you get. Poems. Ah! My sister just, just gave it to me to hold up. That, and oh, don't forget, when you're promoting your books, go like this, because, you know, sometimes they only want a headshot. And put the book there, too. Okay. <laughs> Tips for Joe? Sandra. I quickly ran to the other room to pick up Rodney Gomez's Arsenal with Praise song. Yes, yes, and yes, I vouch for this one. Cool. Very cool. Anyone else? Oh, yeah. People are dropping stuff in the chat. Yeah, Benjamin Garcia, I'm really excited. I'm moderating, moderating that one because, I would, uh, you know, I'm really excited by the the modern portrayals of latinx masculinity that we're seeing in books these days so um that session is tomorrow everybody if you want to join that one it's benjamin garcia may i say one last Gonzalez. thing lily yeah may i say one last thing I, I get a lot of advanced copies of books that haven't been published yet because i'm asked to blurb and there's a book that is that we're searching for scrambling here uh that i just blurbed and it comes out in august it's by a California writer named Jaime Cortez, and it's called Gordo. You cannot forget this title. Gordo, and it's their stories. And it's for, I want to put a plug for Gordo. Bye. Jaime Cortez. Um, Sandra, we have a question for you. Armin wants to know, how do you think your books would be different if you were writing from L.A.? instead of Chicago slash San Antonio? Well, probably if I was in LA, I would have had a car accident by now or I would have been hit by a car because I'm not really good with cars. And that's one of the reasons why I did not live in Los Angeles. Um, I, I, I wondered, you know, my whole life, you know, because my goal had been to come to live in San Antonio for one year and then move to California. It was just a stepping stone for me to get to the promised land of Chicano poets, you know, I wanted to get to California. That was, that was my dream. And uh, I wonder about that myself. I later in my after house on Mongo Street was invited to guest teach at various universities, you know, uh, Chico, uh, Cal State Chico, uh, UC Davis, Berkeley. But once I got there, I said, this is not for me. It doesn't feel Mexican enough, you know, and I, I felt like the landscape didn't look like a Indio Fernandez movie to me. I, I wanted those big clouds, those big sexy clouds. You get anyway. Um, I'll stop there because the camera is like saying, "Cállate ya." <laughs> um, okay, looking through the questions. Oh, for everybody, Jennifer Lares wants to know. When you were looking, she's looking for advice. When you were looking for your first writing job, your first writing gig, what did you use for writing samples?
Any help for Jennifer? Uh, what did I use for writing samples? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question, but I will say that whenever I am writing, I, I rely on all the chicks that I love. Tilly Olson, Catherine Ann Porter, Sandra Cisneros, Norma Cantu, Denise Chavez. I mean, it's every woman you can think of that writes about being lower middle class, working class, and a mother or a single person. Rely on who, who you like to read. Anything else to add? I think that was that was good. Um, this was a question for Joe, but it applies to everybody. When how do you break through that barrier of being able to release your emotions through your work instead of holding back? Joe. I think you're muted, Joe. I just try to take a, what I consider a safer leap or a safe risk. I think there's definitely places that I can dive or deep dive that are a little too dangerous for me right now. So I would take a dive and explore something with um, good intent. Anybody else want to add to uh, I that? Just yeah, I just vomit onto the page, all my emotions. It's kind of like my therapy and everything is game. Everything I'm feeling, all the anger, all the happiness, all the sexual desire, everything is just on the page and then go back and edit. Um, I, I, I would say that- um, I would release it through imagery and metaphor. Mm. Uh, I, I think, for me, uh, because some of the work, I feel like all of my work is scary to me at first, is just to also meet yourself where you're at. Like you may not be ready to write that poem, but like you may write like little stepping stone poems. They're not gonna get you to write that poem that you really have been thinking about. So I would say just meeting yourself where you're at and being patient and, and it will come, you can manifest it. Yeah, it sounds like you all are saying be kind to yourself. Just get it all out. It's it's not it's not about perfection. It's a draft. Be kind mm -hmm. to yourself. Um, for everybody, Marisol wants to know: Is there a poem or essay or book that you that you refer to when you cannot seem to find the motivation to write a specific poem, essay, or book? We're thinking, we're thinking. Um, I, uh, I go to uh, some of the original poems I've read that uh, inspired me to write poetry. One is uh, Nazim, Nazim Hikmet. He's a Turkish poet from mid 20th century. Nazim Hikmet's um, Angina Pectoris uh, poem. Um, and then there's uh, James Wright's poem. Uh, St. Judas, which is a sonnet, and another sonnet by William Matthews, which is uh, Sad Stories Told in Bars, the Reader Digest uh, version. Uh, so I always go back to to the origins that made me want to be a poet or, or write poetry to kind of, uh, you know, restart that spark. Oh, there are several stories I go to. One's an essay, Pride, by Dagoberto Guild. Another one is The Rope by Catherine Ann Park Porter. Um, and A Long and Winding Sheet by Alice Walker. I mean, there's so many that I just go back and reread because the amount of anger, the amount of passion in the writing is just always gives me goosebumps. Um, I, I go to this poem by Jean Valentine uh, called Door in the Mountain. Um, and, uh, you know, at, at the very end of the poem, it says Door in the Mountain, let me in. And it's almost like a spell. Um, but it's a very short poem, Jean Valentine, who, who recently passed, a poet that I, that I really love her entire work. Joe?
I find a lot of um, a lot of myself and Mary Oliver's work, particularly Wild Geese, and that first opening line, "You do not have to be good," and then reminding us at the end of the poem that um, we all belong to the great family of things. I like I like that sensibility, and I hope that's something that um that I'm able to reflect in what I do. Sandra, do you have one? Oh, I think she's frozen. Frozen the screen. Yeah. Yeah, she's frozen. <laughs> um, well, we're almost out of time, so I wanted to give all of you an opportunity for some final remarks. Um, if you have anything to share, um, I'm of course we're going to give Sandra the opportunity to make some final remarks. So uh, why don't we start with John? My my final remarks is thank you very much, Sandra, for inviting us and. Uh, and Lily and uh, Clay Smith, thank you guys, because I, I know there's a whole lot of work people don't see uh, that is going on behind the scenes. So I really appreciate it. And I, and I hope the, the festival online is a great success. And uh, I don't know if we're better or for worse. I, may, I hope we can do this in person uh, next year. Uh, but it's always kind of hard to figure out if that's a good thing or a bad thing at this point. But uh, thank you very much for all this. Christine. Well, thank you. And I'd like to thank Sandra, who's always been a big supporter. I don't know why she likes me, but I'm so glad that she does. <laughs> so thank you. thanks. Uh oh, we lost Sandra. Joe. Oh, just feelings of gratitude and hopefulness. Succinct and perfect. Diana? <laughs> um, just, um, re really grateful that I landed here with such amazing writers who are both friends, um, old friends, um, new friends, and um, I'm sure we'd love to come back and be part of it. And just thanking Sandra for sort of being who she is and also letting me be part of the Mokondo experience. Um, that, that's been a very, uh, just life-changing thing and to Clay Smith and to you, Lily, um, just running all of this. So just really thankful. Yeah. Um, well, I, I hate that, that we lost her right when she was going to wrap it up for us, but, you know, I want to encourage everybody to buy the books from the writers. You know, it all boils down to how can you support these writers? You can read their works. You can buy their books. So we have that buy the books button down below, uh, order their books, buy their books. And, you know, they've given us great reading recommendations here. That's wonderful. And we hope to do this again. Sandra Cease Nettles presents next year at next year's festival i want sandra to, do, to be at all the book festivals every year so um enjoy the rest of the festival everybody um and and thank you thank you for tuning in thank you